There are lots of ways to think about memorials. There are ways to think about monuments. There are ways to think about legacies. Um, but I'm only able to speak about what I know about. Um, and so in the, in the development and the assignment of this, this project, the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, I have a very um, personal connection to the project, which I think I should summarize before I go into talking particularly about the project. Uh, the, first, the first important public commission I ever was awarded was to do a master plan for the reintegration of the World Trade Center with Lower Manhattan. That was back in the early 90s. The World Trade Center was uh, the engine which fueled the development of that area of Lower Manhattan. It was designed in a kind of 60s megastructure mentality, which was inwardly focused. It was a wall and unto itself. It was a city unto itself. It had no connections with, with the outside world. But there was no outside world to connect to. And over time, of course, the world around it grew, and it became more and more and more isolated. So the Port Authority realized, to their credit, that they had a declining asset. They had, a, they had an asset which was about to slide into Class B office status, which would have had a significant impact on their bottom line. And what many people don't understand about the Port Authority of New York is that if you look at a New York City Transit Authority public bus, it will as often as not have a serial number that starts with PA. And if it does start with PA, it means that the Port Authority bought it for the city. And so that revenue was reinvested and reinvested and reinvested, and it was really very important to the regeneration of Lower Manhattan and the vitality of, of New York from the 70s onward. So we finished this master plan, and in the middle of our master planning in 93, the first bombing took place. And we had in our offices the only complete set of documentation of the World Trade Center outside of the, of the World Trade Center. So they sent police cars to pick up these thousands and thousands and thousands of sheets of drawings. And we became the private sector consultants to work with the Port Authority to recover from the first bombing. I was, in fact, the first civilian in that bombing site, uh, which is where the Vista Hotel was, and was privileged to hear a conversation between Leslie Robertson, the, the original structural engineer of the World Trade Center, and some guy who had a jacket with yellow letters on the back that said ATF. And ATF was saying, this is a crime scene, no access, and Les said, well, there's a nor'easter coming, and if you don't let me get to work on reinforcing the Vista Hotel, you may not have a crime scene at the end of the, at the, the nor'easter. So dial forward to, to uh, early September, actually the summer of 2001, and we were busily working. We were all very busy in those days, and I, I, I worked late. I, I, I used to work rather harder than I do now, but I, and I, I worked pretty hard for a long time. And I was up very late that night, and I returned home to my apartment on Duane Street, which those of you know lower Manhattan, well, Duane Street is about 1,200 feet from the center of, of the World Trade Center Plaza. Uh, woke up early, was sitting at my dining table on the 33rd floor looking south west and saw the first plane go by. Didn't really know what it was. It was by in a second. It was the loudest noise I ever heard. Um, ran to the window. The plane was gone. Um, but there was a big hole in the, in the north side of the North Tower. And the rest you know. Yeah. So what we know, what we know is that in, in our collective memories, and what Cliff will talk about as being a, an idea uh, of a cultural memory, that we have in our, in our mind's eyes the creation of an icon that uh, was formed over time and became what we knew, and in an instant was gone. So there was a period of recovery. There was a period when uh, the historical context, icon to icon, if you wish, uh, was created, and, and that period of historical significance is the focus of what our museum development is about. We have symbolic ritual, we have images that we all share, and 
perhaps, and without hyperbole, perhaps 9-11 was the most documented um, event in, in history. So we all know where we were at that moment when, when the World Trade Center was attacked. But in 100 years, there won't be anybody alive, maybe very few, who actually witnessed or were part of that event. So I think this is a critically important element in the formulation of a design for not only a memorial, but for an interpretive museum, which would uh, have to, which would have the, the, the very <coughs> heavy responsibility of telling the story of 9/11 in as clear and in, and an objective a way as possible going forward. So we have the icons that were left behind. We have the column bases, which we all know. We have the ramps, which we use both in the construction and in the um, recovery from the original construction and the recovery from the bombing. We have the romanticized slurry wall, which was, uh, which didn't exist until 9-11. Until it was uh, a series of garage slabs. Uh, and we have the occasional artifact, which was from above ground, uh, this being what is known as the survivor stair, uh, a stair which led from the Memorial Plaza down onto Vizi Street. And what we would say as, as the overall site, um, here you can see the, foot, the, the, the two footprints, the footprint of the, of the North Tower, the footprint of the South Tower, and the image which Daniel Liebskin gave us for the idea of a memorial being the void. And it is as a metaphor, a metaphor for all loss. And so we have the public identification and in, in interaction with the site. Thousands of visitors came every day. Millions have come to see the memorial. Um, and people stood at the perimeter, and this cultural memory, uh, with the with, with the absence of the towers, was really the uh, inspiration, obviously, for reflecting absence, which is uh, which is, by the way, a joint project between Michael Arad and, and Peter Walker, the landscape architect. And just a few little statistical um, little statistical homework uh, that the site is about 460,000 square feet. Uh, the memorial opened in 2011. If it's not complete, the museum is expected to be completed in sometime in 2014. And we used, in the development of our project, um, four underlying principles of design. Uh, and this, this created an armature, which we returned to over and over, in order to focus ourselves on what our mission, in fact, was, and not to be drawn into the ridiculous circuits of media and confrontation, which was encircling the project. And we, in fact, hired a public relations firm to keep us out of the press. They did a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> so here are the four elements. We have memory. We talked about memory. We'll come back to talking about memory. This is why I wanted to uh, have these next two presentations and then have a kind of a 360 roundtable discussion. Authenticity, this is, I think, as important as memory because we have the Holocaust Museum in Washington, we have the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. These are not in authentic locations. These are intentionally placed otherwise. So the notion of authenticity, and we'll come back to it, is terribly important in the design of our Memorial Museum. <coughs> scale, the event had scale, the uh, Context had enormous scale. The, the complex, the memorial, it, uh, the World Trade Center was of enormous, enormous scale. And the project that we're going to be talking about today has elements in it which, uh, the scale of which is incredibly important to, to bear in mind. And then, of course, we have the elephant in the room, which is the emotional content of this project. And I would like to begin a conversation with all of you about the difference between monument, memorial, and legacy, because I think that they're very different, and emotion, uh, I think, plays a big role in, the, in, this, in this discussion. So this is the developed, what we call the Uber site, the, the, uh, the outward, the outward dash red line is the, is the overall site. It's a little over 16 acres. The memorial site itself is a little over eight acres. Uh, and the location of the footprints is terribly, terribly important to the development of both the memorial and the museum because 
the relationship below grade of the actual elements of the buildings to the to the placement in the project which exists today is critically important. There were discussions, there were fights, there were efforts to move the memorial pools off of their authentic footprints. It was for convenience, it was for accommodation, but it was untrue. So we, f we fought, we pushed back, we fought, and today the, the memorial pools are located, um, are centered exactly on the footprints of the original towers. In a traditional museum, and I've designed several for working on the African American Museum in the Mall in Washington, a traditional museum, the, uh, the icon houses the exhibits. And if you think about the Guggenheim, the Whitney, you think about the great museums around the world, that icon is, is what, you, what comes to mind before you think about the exhibits. You think about the Louvre and then the Mona Lisa, but first you think about the Louvre, at least I do. Um, we have the inverse at the Memorial Museum. What we have is a museum which is, in fact, the icon. So it w we had to train ourselves to think as designers in another kind of way. <coughs> Just again, <coughs> the site of the Memorial Museum inscribed on the, on the Memorial Plaza. And some program elements which are, which are important, and, and the architects in the room understand that, that to design a project which doesn't meet its programmatic responsibilities is inherently unsuccessful. So, so we, were very, we were very focused on, on these obligations. We had to provide meaningful, a meaningful descent and access to, to in situ artifacts, and there is, in fact, a, an agreement with the National Park Service called the Section 106 Agreement, where we have uh, agreed with consulting parties to make available uh, certain kinds of historic resources and artifacts. So then you have the authenticity, you have the scale, uh, you have the memory of these things. And as we go forward, I'll, I'll explain to well, Our project is about 120,000 square feet, which makes it bigger than the Whitney or the Guggenheim, just to give you a comparison. Um, we have a 70-foot high building, but our roof is at grade. Our, base, our, our first floor, our lower level, is 70 feet, is minus 70 feet. So it's a really a very unique proposition to design a museum which doesn't have, in fact, an iconic presence at all, except as an interior space. Um, our project has site boundaries which were defined for us. We inherited these boundaries. Uh, the edges of the, me, the edges of the of the site. This is the. Uh, this is the demising edge to the path, which is in this zone. To the north, we have the Freedom Tower. To the west, uh, these are the tunnel entries, which came in from various uh, infrastructure lines. And then, of course, this zone in here, uh, which is, has been defined as a mechanical plant, which has been installed for the, for the, for the cooling load for the 12 million square feet of office space, which, is, which eventually will be developed on the space. So you have all of this kit which is defined in this uh, object, which is floating above, and you drop it in. And you can see that the site is beginning to diminish, that what we have to work with is beginning to diminish. Add to that what was uh, included um, later on, the chiller plant, and in the corner, uh, in this north corner, access, uh, egress, emergency egress access, and then the memorial pools and the plaza. Add to that last thing, the entry pavilion and the vent structures, and you can see that this is a really complicated site. It has a lot going on, and what we have to work with as, as museum designers uh, is essentially what's left over. So how did we approach this? We started to work with the authenticity. Uh, the image to the right is our original construction shots from the original World Trade Center. We have uh, the loss and the, and the scale, we have the motion, and we have the pools themselves, which are enormously impressive uh, to see when you get to be below grade. But these, if you, but look carefully at these dotted lines. The outline on the floor, of what we call bedrock, which is uh, level 242, and we don't exactly know what 242 refers to. It's some abstract number that we inherited. Um, level 242 is where the column bases were cut. The pools align perfectly with these, with these outlines. This is really a very important uh, element in our design. 
We were brought on board in uh, April of 2004 to figure out how to construct the memorial in the first place. We were not, we did not participate in the competition. Um, there were three finalists that were considered for this assignment of, they, they came up with a euphemism called the associate architect, but we had to figure out how to build this thing. Um, Guathmi was one, was one of the others, and so was Polchek. So they were looking with somebody, for somebody to work with Michael Rod and Peter Walker and develop the potential for this project. Um, in case you have ever wondered how much water flows through these fountains, it's 37,000 gallons per minute per pool. It will be a lead gold project if you can do it. So here we have this conceptual approach, the elements of aligning the pools with the, with, with the column bases. This is, this is really important because if you move down below, if this alignment were to move off a meter, say two meters, you would see it instantaneously. You'd know that there was a misalignment. It would, it would be uncomfortable. It would be untrue. So we had to figure out how to get what potentially was going to number, I don't know, three and a half to five million people a year. It has to do with the final exhibition layout, which the capacity will be governed by, by, the, by the constraints of the exhibitions, but we have theoretical egress for about five million people a year. And we have the symbolism of both the original construction ramp on the left and the whole road which was built to uh, enable the recovery on the right. So that symbolism and the emotional connection which you all had to the events, the, the processional uh, carrying of bodies uh, out of the site. And I don't know how closely you followed any of this, but out of the 29 some odd um, deaths, victims, there were only 200 plus funerals. So the destruction was that complete, that they were unable to identify any organic remains for the vast majority of the victims. So the project is really about the people. It's about understanding how to tell the story of, of what happened on that, on that day, the story of the recovery and the lives, the story of the lives of the people. It's not an icon to, uh, it's, it's not an iconic museum in the sense of a, of a physical presence. It has a much more spiritual setting. So we have the, the memory, the authenticity, the scale, and the emotion. We began to look at how the volumes of the pools could be accommodated within the design of this museum. How to separate the imposed from the, from the archaeological, the created from the archaeological. So we made some conscious decisions to separate elements and to keep this separation consistent in, in throughout the development of this museum. So as we defined the site a minute ago, uh, you can see where the pools are, you can see the areas that are left over for us to develop for exhibition space, uh, and, and the insertion of what we call the ribbon, which is an, a man-made element, which is going to be a descent ramp, bring you into the museum, through an inch pavilion which has been designed by Snohetta. There's been some discussion about who is designing the museum. Snohetta are the architects of the, of the entry pavilion who cross the plaza threshold and we take over. So here's the plan as it developed. We have the, the entrance through a series of stairs and escalators at this location. We have a gathering site uh, which is called Memorial Hall but it's really an orientation space. Uh, and then we begin a descent down. Now this descent follows a couple of decisions which the visitors will already have made. The first decision is to visit the memorial in the first place. So you have to cross a threshold across Church Street, across Greta Street, across whatever it is that you're, however you're arriving at the memorial, you've made a decision to visit the memorial. So you leave the everyday world that you, through which you've arrived, the emotional setting changes, the emotional construct changes as you move into the memorial. You have an experience at the memorial, you have to make another decision. Do you want to descend into the museum? Do you want to descend towards, towards bedrock, which is in fact the graveyard? And so once that decision is made, you have to go through an airport security check, but um, you arrive here at Memorial, Feet, memorial Hall, which is some 
20, 22, 23 feet below the surface, and you begin, uh, you begin an experience. You begin, you have a first view of the corners of the two towers, so you realize that you're standing in between the towers. You begin to descend through the introductory exhibit, which is a, which is a sloped floor. It's a 5% slope. We need no, we need no accommodation for ADA or any other kinds of. Uh, disability-related uh, um, progression. And you arrive at a point about here where you have, a, where you have your first, where we, where we present you with the first um, view of the, of the historic site of the slurry wall. So there's a progressive disclosure along the route. Um, there is, there is, we've had a moment, at, and I'm going to show you illustrations of these, uh, of, of these spaces as we get to the bottom. But you have the first overlook, this space, just to give you the scale. Um, this space is about the size of the, grand, of the Great Hall at Grand Central Station. This is an acre. This is an acre. And the spaces are really big. The scale is really big. And nothing has been done to burnish, change, or distort the scale, the impact, the emotion, or the memory of these spaces. This ramp is made out of wood, distinctly separate from the the concrete, which is of the slurry wall, the concrete, which is of the retaining walls, the concrete, which is of the floor. And then we have the bedrock level, which is about 95,000 square feet. There will be uh, exhibits, uh, some didactic, some less so, uh, presented along the route. We have the primary exhibit, which is being, which is being built and was destroyed by Hurricane Sandy. Um, everything from 15 feet down had to be taken out and redone. We had nine feet of standing water throughout the 16 acres thing. So here is an image of, of the of essentially the three-dimensional boundaries of our site, what we inherited, what the geometries uh, with which we were contending, uh, how they lay out, and how we imposed this, this ramp structure, which is called the ribbon. It's built. Wood isn't in, but it's built. Here we have that first overlook. And then uh, a good three-dimensional um, image which explains how the museum is, is defined. Now, I've never worked on a building that didn't have an outside before. We have, and the primary reason why there seemed to be so little progress made across, uh, across the site for so many years was that the build-out necessarily started at the bottom and had, was working up. And we had to get to 70 feet in the air across 16 acres before above ground progress was visible. But in the memorial, there was never going to be any above ground visibility because it is inherently an underground event. So here's a section that's been fairly widely published. Um, it shows the entry pavilion, which seems to be uh, larger than in fact it is. A good deal of the entry pavilion is mechanical equipment, which is handling the path mezzanine, the, the Calatrava mezzanine. We have the two, we have the two tridents, which are, uh, which were removed from the fret, which were removed at the site and preserved by a team of cons of conservators. Um, they weigh 70 tons each. They have structure which goes all the way to bedrock, uh, and you can see the way the ramp develops, uh, moving to the west. Here is a an early rendering of what we, what we understood to be the presentation of the space and how, it, and how it would develop. This is a shot I took last week. Uh, we have a continuous ceiling throughout because the site is a single site, it's united, it isn't particularly demised uh, independently of any of its internal elements. Uh, as you move to that overlook and begin to look out over the west chamber, uh, how we envisioned it again. This is all internal simulation. Uh, and the shot that was taken last week uh, of that hall, and just to give you an idea of the scale, that's a, that's a 60 foot cherry picker. Um, the span across here is about 105 feet. We're carrying, oh, I don't know. 150 foot oaks on these trusses 
in that quadrant of the, of the plaza. There will be 100 and 425 trees when, when the build-out is complete. And as you move down the ramp, and, and you, uh, this is the last decision you have to make, which is whether you want to move from that ramp down to bedrock or not. There is a choice to make. You can take another leader out. You can leave. It gets to be too much. Throughout the process, throughout the procession, we have provided outlets and ways for people to say enough. So there will be different kinds of visitation experiences. There will be longer ones. There will be shorter ones. And in this, inserted into this uh, procession down to the left, there is an escalator which is being installed. This is the survivor stair, which I showed you earlier in the presentation, that piece of stair which was preserved from Vizi, uh, from the plaza down to Vizi Street, uh, and the ceremonial stair which we've installed. The demising wall through to the, at the east for the Calatrava, and I should add that in a section, behind a section of this, is where the New York City Medical Examiner will, will, will maintain the unidentified remains. A view from the south, along the, along the south pool, towards the, towards the descent stairs. A view of that space as it exists today. And artifacts that we've revealed throughout the recovery period. This is an original grade beam in place at the south end of the site. Just to give you an idea, that's about, that's about 11 inches of solid plate steel. As a, as, a, as a foundation plate and the grade beams. These are the column bases. This is one of the most controversial uh, of all of the artifacts. This is the impact steel. This is the, this is the top half of a piece of steel that, was, uh, that met the first plane at 1158 on 9-11. On Just to give you a sense of scale. This is the other half of that piece of steel. I'm sorry, this is the other half of that piece of steel. One interesting thing is that we've discovered that there are no, there is no machinery um, on earth that can take a piece of steel of this, of this size and bend it in, in ways that we found it. Um, a couple million pounds of jet fuel burning at 1,600 degrees, though, have a, have a different kind of effect. This is the last column. This is the last piece of uh, steel that was removed during the recovery. It was, it was conserved, and it was protected in a, in a temperature and a humidity-controlled environment. And here it is today. This is the return of, this was a year and a half ago, Cliff? Two years ago? Yeah. When, they, when they installed it. It was kept, at, at LaGuard, it was kept out at JFK in, a, in, a hang, in Hangar 17. And again, that space again too. <coughs> so we've been working with a range of material types. Obviously, there's an awful lot of concrete. This is not an art museum. This is, uh, this, this is an interpretive center for an event which will be reinterpreted. Somebody asked about how you make a facility uh, possible to reinterpret over, over time. So the historic resources, I think, and the, the procession down, the locations and the relationship between the elements of the site, I, with these are a story that uh, have no interpretation. They are, they are what they are, and they will be preserved the story that is told, the interpretation that is offered, uh, that may evolve over time. And this armature will enable that evolution. Uh, different curatorial and societal forces will be at work over the next hundred years, I, I can't say. All I know is that it will happen. The material that we use to enclose the memorial uh, the memorial pools, which we call the, which we call the volumes, is a recycled aluminum. It's called phase, It's called uh, it's called foamed aluminum. It's never been used at this scale. It's a material that was in, that was developed for the uh, avionics industry. There's tremendous 
tremendous strength in the x, y coordinates, but none in the z. Very light, very appropriate, we think, for uh, the representation of a, of a volume that was, that is representing a tower that is gone. And we preserve moments that, that existed um, in terms of the cultural memory of the site. We preserved moments that everybody enjoyed uh, when they were available. Uh, that moment when you stood between the towers and looked straight up and the parallax that developed. We've presented that moment three times in this, in the development of the procession of this museum. Here you can see the museum. The, this is the northwest corner of the South Pool. And I'll just conclude with some images that um, some of which have been published, some of which have not. So despite the controversy, despite the lack of transparency, despite it all, um, quite, a lot has, quite a lot has happened. And, and we as a team are agnostic to some degree about the politics. Uh, we're architects, we have, a, we have a commission, we have a program, we have an attitude, we have an opinion. Um, but I think the results are, are tangible. And the difference between memorial and monument and legacy, I think, is, is, a, is a conversation that, that, this, that, that this conference should talk about as we go forward. I'll just leave you with a couple of last images. I think that's it. Thank you.